In the early 1900s, the Dreadnought arms race was steadily underway. Powers all across the planet were building larger and stronger Dreadnought designs by the year, from various European countries fighting in the Atlantic to Japan vying for control of the Pacific. America was building a fleet capable of fighting in both, and even many South American countries competed to purchase progressively more absurd and powerful designs from other powers. An interesting story for another time. In today's video, we'll be discussing a ship so strong, not even two nukes were enough to sink it. This is the story of the USS Nevada. From ancient times, mankind has yearned to master the seas both for trade and for warfare. As centuries passed, we learned and adapted our seafaring vessels to be stronger and more well-equipped to face off against anything they could encounter. From the ships of the line during the Age of Sail to modern nuclear submarines, this is Sails and Salvos. This series premiere of Sails and Salvos has been brought to you by Daily Peanut. Nowadays, it seems like you can't go anywhere without being broadsided by news platforms with breaking stories. I know personally it can be exhausting trying to keep up with everything without being tuned in 24-7. That's where Daily Peanut comes in to help. Instead of sitting through dry, time-consuming cable news or reading mile-long articles, they provide you a daily dose of news along with some humor thrown in for good measure. This is a great way to see the most important stories without ruining your day with the doom and gloom of many news sites. You can join for free using the link in the description and join the over 250,000 readers getting Daily Peanut in their inbox every morning. Huge thanks to them for sponsoring the video. Now let's get sailing with today's topic. America, with two oceans to cover and the industry to build a large fleet, was steadily keeping pace with the European powers both in numbers and in innovation. America's very first dreadnought class, the South Carolinas, featured super-firing turret pairs, or mounting one turret above and behind the other to give them better firing arcs, which would become a standard design element for all countries in the next few years. The scope of the Dreadnought project gradually increased alongside the other countries, with the Delaware class carrying an additional turret, the Florida class being larger and having better stability, and the Wyoming class kicking the guns up to the more powerful 12-inch 50 caliber Mark VII. America's designs kept steamrolling ahead to the New York class, their first Super Dreadnought with the 14-inch 45 caliber Mark I cannon giving it more punch to defeat the gradually thickening armor of opposing Dreadnought designs. On the political side of things, Congress wasn't giving the General Board the amount of battleships they desired. While it had been agreed on that two battleships would be purchased per year, only one was actually being purchased most years. This led to the General Board requesting three each year to make up for the deficit. Meanwhile, the battleship designs were getting larger and more expensive, placing further strain on the economic side and making Congress hesitant to fund battleships that would be obsolete within a few years. President Howard Taft got Congress to purchase two ships in 1912, which became USS Nevada and USS Oklahoma, the two ships of the Nevada class. When President Woodrow Wilson came into power in 1913, he turned down proposals for significantly larger battleships after the Nevada class, resulting in these setting the new design standard for what would become the standard type battleship. The Pennsylvania, New Mexico, Tennessee, and Colorado classes that followed were all part of the standard types. They had an overall similar design, allowing them to easily mesh together in the battle line. This was unlike other countries that had fast and slow battleships, requiring their lines to be split or resulting in difficulties maneuvering as a group. The class was the head of multiple technological innovations and very ahead of its time. It was the first Dreadnought class to embrace the all-or-nothing armor scheme. This design was meant to provide protection to the ship's most important sections in long-range gun duels. This came in the form of increased deck armor and belt armor over the boilers, magazines, and command sections with no secondary turtleback layer behind them, along with other segments of the ship having minimal armor as to not set off shell fuses. The most telling example of this design's effectiveness is the design shifts of every country after the Battle of Jutland. While other countries had to redesign their dreadnoughts for long-range gunfights, America's were already optimized for this, meaning they had to make minimal adjustments. By World War II, all-or-nothing armor schemes were used primarily by every country's newly constructed battleships, other than Germany, who still used turtleback armor on the Scharnhorst and Bismarck classes. They also swapped from coal-fired boilers, or a hybrid of oil and coal-fired boilers, to purely oil. This had various advantages. With America being a major producer of oil at the time, they wouldn't have to worry about importing their fuel, which was a concern for some other countries. Oil could output more energy for the weight carried than coal, increasing the range of oil-fired battleships. 
It also didn't produce the dirty soot that burning coal pumped out, which could block optics, and the oil-fired boilers could be run for longer without needing filters to be cleaned like on the coal-fired ones. Another major innovation was using three cannon turrets. Previously, dreadnoughts had used two cannon turrets only, resulting in complex internal layouts, extra weight, and longer ships. The Nevada class solved this by placing three guns into the bottom turrets in the fore and aft super-firing pairs, meaning it could carry ten cannons in four turrets, as opposed to the five needed by other dreadnoughts. This came at the expense of extra complexity in the loading process, however this was well worth the reduction in weight and length. This allowed the extra weight to be redistributed to the armor scheme for additional protection. Three cannon turrets would become common on battleships after this, and eventually on cruisers, again showing the design of the Nevada was ahead of its time. As for the actual history of the Nevada, how did these design innovations hold up in combat? With Nevada being commissioned in 1916, it was finished in time to take part in World War I. However, it wasn't able to head to Britain initially due to their shortage of oil, causing America to send over four coal-fired battleships instead. Nevada was actually the last American warship to join the vessels sent across the Atlantic, only arriving in August of 1918. All it did during the remainder of the war was convoy escort duty, though it and nine other battleships did escort USS George Washington carrying Woodrow Wilson to France for the Paris peace talks. After this, she was returned home. Next up came the interwar period, which while there was no war, some interesting events did come up. USS Nevada took part in some cruises to other countries, such as the Centennial of Brazilian Independence and the Goodwill Cruise to Australia and New Zealand. Nevada also got some pretty major refits during the late 20s. Tripod masts, geared turbines, anti-torpedo bulges, new boilers, two aircraft catapults, a new superstructure, and some 5-inch 25 caliber anti-aircraft guns were installed. This would be the design she entered World War II in. Her first fight of the war came right at the cause of America's entry, the infamous Pearl Harbor attack. Franklin D. Roosevelt had moved the Pacific Fleet to Hawaii to pressure Japan, which they punished with a surprise attack on December 7, 1941. Of the eight American battleships present at the harbor, all eight were standard types, with Nevada being among them. Nevada was away from the other battleships at the time of the attack, giving more room for maneuvering. Nevada initially took a single torpedo from a B-5N torpedo bomber, the listing from which was corrected by counter-flooding. In the second wave, Nevada was targeted by significantly more aircraft. Five 250kg bombs were dropped onto Nevada by D-3A dive bombers, dealing significant damage. To prevent the ship from sinking entirely, Nevada grounded herself. During the attack, the ship had lost 60 crew, with 109 being wounded. After this, Nevada needed repairs. She was sent to Puget Sound Navy Yard, both to get repairs and some refits. The old 5-inch 51s and 5-inch 25s were replaced with the 5-inch 38, America's legendary dual-purpose cannon that made its way onto surface warships of just about every class. Other changes included getting 32 40mm Bofors autocannons and 40 20mm Orlikin autocannons. Never again would she be an easy target for aerial attackers. After the completion of Nevada's refitting in mid-1943, she was put onto convoy duty. There were concerns that a German capital ship would be sent to raid convoys, as Bismarck had attempted to do in 1941, so keeping battleships assigned to convoys provided some defense. Nevada was then brought to the United Kingdom in preparation for the invasion of Normandy, and was part of the ships providing shore bombardment during the D-Day landings. It's notable that Nevada was the only battleship to have been at both the Pearl Harbor attack and the Normandy landings. After this, Nevada provided more shore bombardment services and was sent back to the Pacific for the first push against Japan. In February 1945, Nevada arrived at Iwo Jima, providing fire support for the invasion force. After that, she then assisted in the invasion of Okinawa, again providing fire support. A force of seven Japanese kamikazes attacked the naval force at dawn, with one crashing into Nevada's number 3 turret, killing 13 crew and wounding 49 while also disabling the turret. By the end of the war, Nevada was well within firing distance of the Japanese home islands, though no bombardment was ordered. After World War II ended, America was considering which battleships to keep and which to dispose of. With Nevada being over 32 years old, it was too obsolete to keep in a modern fleet. Nevada's final mission was to be used as a target ship for 1948's Operation Crossroads atomic bomb tests. The ship was painted orange, and in the first test, it was directly targeted with the first airdrop bomb. The bomb was off the mark and Nevada survived. The second bomb was an underwater detonation, which Nevada yet again survived along with several tanks which had been placed on her deck. 
After this, it was towed to Pearl Harbor but was far too damaged and radioactive to have any real value. It was used for target practice by some other American vessels, but no matter what they fired at her, she refused to surrender. Finally, on the 31st of July, 1948, an aircraft launched a torpedo into the midsection of the ship, finally sinking it. The wreck wound up at a depth of 4,700 meters, 675 nautical miles southwest of Pearl Harbor, being rediscovered on the 29th of April 2020. There she remains to this day, along with the tanks which survived the blast alongside her. If any ship can be said to have truly been all but unsinkable, that honor has to be placed on the Nevada. Huge thanks to Flip Stug for doing the research for this video. I love to share history with you all, but I'm not as knowledgeable about ships compared to tanks. If you enjoyed the video, please head over and check out his channel, which focuses more heavily on naval content, including several historical videos about some interesting designs. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to have him come back to help with future videos as well. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss upcoming videos in this new series, as well as my other ones. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.